Overall, Mark, I think you you bought yourself a fun sled here, a fun sled here, a fun sled here, a fun sled here, a fun sled here. Bulkhead, 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 bulkhead. Shoot! Oh, I'm not even close to being done. I gotta get this bulkhead fixed for him. I don't even know if I let him know about it. Ah, I gotta go. <laughs> good well everybody it's been about a month that I've been working on and off on my friend Mark's Skidoo GTX this is a 2005 model with the 500 SS motor in it when we first looked at this thing and gave it an overview in Trenton Ontario in a parking lot we noted a few issues that we knew we were gonna have to deal with things like uh, the control arm bushings the ball joints it needed carbides. It needed a lot of the usual things that a 17-year-old sled would need. We also tested the stator, or at least tested the output of the stator at the battery, and we were getting no voltage at all coming out of the stator. So we assumed we were probably going to either be into a voltage regulator or a complete stator replacement. Now it turned out that wasn't the issue at all. It was really just bad grounds and once we went through and cleaned all of those grounds up the charging system started to work however when we took the exhaust and the exhaust can the muffler itself off of the sled we found something that we just were not expecting it appeared that probably at some point anyway in time someone had had an accident on the left side of this snowmobile so that would be the one with your or sorry, the right side of the snowmobile, left, right, I can't keep it straight anymore. And that damage was in behind the muffler and the exhaust pipe and basically had bent the tunnel in quite severely. Now we had asked the previous owner if she was aware of it ever being in an accident and she indicated that it hadn't been. So we took that on face value. Now, whether she knew or had never been in behind that exhaust before, the reality was the actual tunnel in behind the exhaust can was bent and it was bent fairly severely. It was interesting because when I climbed around underneath it and looked at the shock towers and everything, those looked pretty good. And I really didn't think that the tunnel had been tweaked and certainly not tweaked to the extent that it is. But it is true that these old rev chassis do have a reputation of a fairly weak tunnel and even moderate impacts on either side of those ski towers can lead to some damage. Now the clutch side looks fine. It looks nice and straight. I put a straight edge on it. It's fine, but I did have to deal with this one side, which is unfortunate. The fortunate thing is there are kits available such as this one that once you straighten the tunnel out, you rivet and bolt these in place and these stiffen that side of the chassis up and make it just about as good as new. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at how to install a kit like this and get Mark's sled closer and closer to being completed. I have about 10 days left now to get this sled completed, ready for him to come and get it delivered out the door. So why don't we get started by maybe taking a closer look at the kit that I bought and some caveats for anybody that's looking to buy one of these kits because I did learn a bit of a, a lesson here when I bought these. Okay, let's go over and take a look on the bench over there. This is what you get when you order one of these kits and I found this one on eBay Canada. It was about $130 plus uh, um, delivery. I think it came in around, I don't know, one, 148 bucks or something like that. 
and it comes with several different components. The three pieces that we're going to focus on today is this one here, this one, and this guy up here as well. These three components kind of fit together like this. And after you remove the stock fasteners and rivets, these are installed using stainless steel hardware, so stainless rivets. And up here, it had self-tapping bolts that go through and connect everything together. This kit is very well made. It's made out of very robust, thick aluminum. It's either die cut or laser cut. I'm not 100% sure here. Everything seems to fit really well. And on the clutch side, it even comes with a quarter inch thick reinforcing plate that I hopefully will have time to get installed for Mark. It shouldn't take too long. Both of these kits are, are, or both of these sides are very similar. The one caveat that I would say is when I ordered this and it was delivered and it came in about three days. So this is really, really good delivery. I opened it up and there was no hardware in here at all, nothing. I contacted the dealer and said, listen, I think maybe you forgot to put the hardware uh, package in here. He got back to me right away and said, oh, actually some of these kits are sold with and some are sold without hardware. I bought a kit without the hardware. So I have the necessary uh, hardware to put this in. It takes stainless steel rivets. I have those and I'm going to use some grade eight or 8.8 .8 metric fasteners up here when the, when I need them. But it is something to keep uh, in mind when you're ordering one of these things. If you don't have the hardware, make sure you buy a kit that comes with the hardware. And when it comes to installing stainless steel fasteners, you're probably gonna need something more than just a standard sort of pistol grip um, rivet gun. You are gonna need something either like the one that's like a bolt cutter or what I have, which is an air powered uh, uh, rivet gun. It'll pull these stainless rivets tight and it, it'll make your day a lot easier. Now, when it comes to installing this, my initial thought was to actually both rivet it, but then also add some adhesive between the bulkhead and this bracket. And I contacted my good friend, Bill Hamilton, uh, to ask him sort of what type of adhesive should I be using there? And what he recommended was Silk Flex, which is about $30 a tube on Amazon. And it's a, a marine grade adhesive that would bond this bracket to the bulkhead. And I truly believe that's the best way to do this. It would really stiffen everything up. However, I got thinking a bit, Bill, and um, I may want to actually take this bracket off in the future if I ever choose to remove the engine. And the reason for that is I straightened out the tunnel and you're going to see how I did that in this video. But I think with the engine out, I could further refine that straightening process and get the tunnel even straighter, at which point I would reinstall this bracket with some form of silk flex adhesive in there to bond it all together. But Today, I'm not gonna do that. We're gonna follow the instructions and just put this in and use fasteners to tie it back into the bulkhead. Okay, let's take a look at the damage and how I straightened this out. This here is the offending component. It doesn't look too bad now if you look at it. It looks fairly straight. I've spent quite a bit of time wrapping away getting that thing flat. However, when I took the muffler off to gain access to the stator, this is what I found. You can see that the actual bulkhead is bent in so far, it almost touches the recoil cover. Now this was quite alarming for me. I was absolutely in the dumps. I had recommended this sled to my friend Mark, and when I got into it, I realized, holy cow, I missed a major flaw. If you do some research into rev chassis, this type of damage is very, very common. In fact, some people would say 70 to 90% of rev chassis out there today 
have probably received some form of a tweak or a bend to this area or the clutch side area in their lives. And many of them have never been fixed because people just either don't notice them or they don't know how to fix them. This support plate, once you get this straightened, fits in like this and uses the factory holes to strengthen and reinforce the repair that you make to this area. All right, it's me from the future, and you can tell because of the fantastic haircut. I did want to take a bit of time right now just to stress the importance of getting that tunnel as straight as you can before you try to put the bracket on there. The bracket really is not designed to straighten the chassis, it's designed to support the chassis after you straighten it as flat as you can. Take your time, use whatever tools are available, like I'm gonna show you like with a bridge puller or an air hammer, or just some regular hammers to get that thing as flat and straight as you possibly can. The more time you spend and the better job you produce will ultimately result in a better situation when you go to put that bracket on there. Okay, let's get back to the bracket video. Hmm. I used several different techniques to actually get the bends out of here. The most important of those was probably using a bridge puller that I made out of some scrap steel. I used some one inch by one inch by eighth inch wall steel that I was able to put across the tunnel itself and then using this hole here, the one that has the rubber bumper for your exhaust, I put some threaded rod in there and actually was able to pull that bend back out while I used a series of different hammers to massage the aluminum back in until it was as straight as I could get it. To make this easier, I did remove the recoil and I'm gonna remove the recoil again today because I'm gonna to wanna to be able to get back in behind there with as much space as possible. And it'll also make it a little bit easier for me to get these fasteners off of this um, handlebar bracket right here, which those do have to come off. I also used um, an air hammer to help flatten some of these components. And once I get this piece off here, this factory support piece, I'm actually going to see if I can flatten it a little bit more with that air hammer just to sort of refine how flat I can get it. Right now I'm trying to bend two pieces of aluminum that's all riveted together. I think when I get that piece off, this aluminum will actually um, be a little bit more malleable and I'll be able to, again, refine it into, into how I want to do this. So the first thing we need to do here is actually grind off all of the factory rivets that correspond with these holes here. So I'll get to work on that and then we'll have to punch those rivets back out and through. So to start with again, I think I'm gonna take off the recoil and I'll just put it up out of the way and that will give us a little bit more room in behind there if we need it. All right, let's get started. To remove the recoil, there are four bolts that fasten onto the recoil plate itself. And they use one of these. This is a T30 Torx head wrench. Now, two of them are quite accessible from up above here, where you can just sort of get in there and undo them. The other two are a little more difficult, and you gain access to them through these holes here. Uh, there's one there, I think, and one over there. You want to make sure not to lose those bolts. They are metal, so if you do happen to drop one, you can use a magnet. But they are a little bit difficult to get out. Once I do, I'll just pull this plate off and I'll lift it up and hang it up here and get it out of the way. All right, we've got all the bolts out. 
Now the recoil itself, it just pulls back and out like that. It really comes out easy. And I'm just gonna bring it up here and I'll hang it over the handlebars. And this gives us much more room in behind the bulkhead. The first two fasteners that I'm actually gonna take out are these two fasteners here. These support the handlebar bracket or the handlebar support itself. And the bracket actually uses those to help register where you need to drill holes and also where I need to cut this factory support because it actually goes in behind the brake caliper. I'll use that just with a couple 10 millimeter wrenches. So a box end and a ratchet wrench and I'll take those out. Once we have those two nuts off of there, you can see we can line up the bracket really, really well. And then what we need to do next is actually take some kind of a marking tool and scribe the back of this bracket to know where to cut the factory support bracket off. Now you could do this with a marker. I'm going to use a scratch all as it's going to give me a little bit finer, more refined line. I'll do that now. With that line scribed in there, I'm now going to put the bracket back in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and actually identify with magic marker which rivets actually have to be removed. So I see this one down here does for sure. All of these have to come off. And that looks like about it. I think that's pretty good. Now rivets are challenging at the best of time to remove. Aluminum rivets you can drill out really easy, but these are steel rivets. I think the best thing and what the manual suggests is to get my angle grinder in here and actually grind the heads off these and then I'm going to punch them out using either a hammer or my air hammer and uh, clean those holes up. It's gonna be a little bit messy, so I'm just gonna go ahead and grind away. The nice thing here is because this is sacrificial, you can be fairly aggressive grinding and it'll be able to pump those out. So I'll just keep on going. Okay, we have all of the rivets ground off. The next thing is to pound them through to make room for the new mounting plate. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna try it first with a punch, but I do have an air hammer and I'm probably gonna use an air hammer to whack most of these out of here. But uh, we'll give it a shot first by hand. All right, I have a small drift here. and see if I can pound some of these out. I'm gonna use a fairly large hammer. That one there is moving, but it seems to be moving the steel in the back too. I may need to drill that. Let's try one of these ones up top here. Hmm. Yeah, they're not moving. I can see why they said to use an air hammer. I have one. I think I'm going to break it out. All right, here's my air hammer. These things are quite powerful, surprisingly. And I just got a small little chisel point on here that I think I'll be able to sort of center onto those rivets and sort of gently 
pound them through. You can feather these a little bit if you want to get them started before you go full wide open. This is a noisy, noisy job. The air compressor is going to be kicking on quite a bit. So I'll get to work on this and I'll get all these pounded out of here. So I'm finding it difficult to keep it centered on there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill a small, just a basically a centering hole here so that the air hammer will stay centered on the rivet. So let's try that. That's better. The last thing we need to do is cut this outer bracket away from the main tunnel. So you can see that score line that we put in earlier. I'm going to try to do this with this Dremel that I have here and be as accurate as I can. I don't want to cut into the bottom material if I can at all uh, help it. So I think what I'm going to do is I'll probably put a little wedge under there just to give me a little bit of breathing room as I cut. Now I'm probably going to have to make several cuts when I do this because when you put it under load like that, what's going to happen is going to want to pinch the blade. But I think I'll just use one of these rubber supports, put it underneath there, and it'll give me just a little bit more space. So why don't we try this now? There we go. It snapped clean off. That's not too bad. Now that I've got everything cleaned up, I used a vacuum, some uh, brake cleaner, and an air compressor, and I cleaned everything up. I was able to mount these first two pieces using these two bolts as a registration. What the kit suggests that you use are Clecos, and I have Clecos, but you don't really need to have these. So I'm going to show you how to do it without. Now Clecos are really handy if you do have them. They allow you to bolt the pieces together or temporarily rivet them, I guess is really the better term. And then if you need to, you can take the piece apart again. But most people don't have Clecos, but they do have the clamps. So what you're going to do is take a, uh, one or two of your uh, C-clamps like this, line everything up, and you can use drill bits to run through the holes that are here. And when you get it good and lined up, you just tighten that up. I'm going to go through and drill all of these extra rivet holes and start the riveting process to get this thing put back together. And as I move along, I'll just reposition my clamp and I'll pull that piece in tight. When you do start to drill through the bulkhead here, make sure there's nothing in behind it. You have coolant lines, and if you didn't take off your recoil, that's in the way too. So just be careful not to punch through into anything. There's even a coolant line way down here where you're gonna be drilling. So if you're suspect of that, put something in behind there like a piece of metal or even plywood would help just to make sure that when you finally do cut through that uh, you don't hit anything. I do want to talk a little bit about rivets. Pop rivets, that is. If you've been around snowmobiling for any length of time, you probably have a collection of rivets. I have a box here and I got more up in there, all kinds of different sizes. But rivets are a great way to fasten two pieces of metal together, sort of flat, and they give great holding power. There are some things though that you do need to understand about rivets. First thing is they come in different sizes down to an eighth of an inch and up to a quarter inch diameter of that shank right there. Rivets come in all sorts of different lengths and you can kind of see here. Also the button head on them can be different sizes depending on what material and how wide you want to spread the load out is. 
The actual diameter of these shafts here varies, I think from one eighth of an inch up to quarter inch is usually what you're going to be able to find. And the length of that shaft is also variable. You can see this one here is just about an eighth of an inch. This one's almost three quarters of an inch. This I think is half inch. The length of that shaft helps to determine what they call grip range, I think is, is what it's called. And what that means is these rivets have a thickness range that they actually will function within. In some cases, like this long three quarter inch, you may not be able to grip two pieces of material if they aren't greater than three eighths of an inch. There's just, they'll end up bottoming out and the rivet will be loose. In this case, you probably only have an eighth of an inch of thickness. You can't go any thicker or this rivet won't actually be able to mushroom out effectively and hold two pieces together. Now this grip range is laid out on the front of every um, rivet package that you're going to buy. For example, these stainless steel rivets that I bought from Rofasco are a 3 16th inch diameter. So that's the diameter of this part. And they have a grip range between one quarter and three eighths of an inch thickness. So I think when I actually measured the width of, or the thickness of all of those stacks of aluminum, it fell, I think, at, at uh, it was less than three eighths. I'm trying to remember. I can't remember exactly, but it was less than three eighths of an inch. So this will work really, really well for the application that I have. Um, and, and different, again, different lengths here will have different grip ranges. The other thing you need to consider is what is the rivet itself made out of? What's the material it's made out of? They even make plastic rivets out there that you can buy, but most of the rivets you're going to probably use will be like this, which is aluminum. Now this is really soft and you can use just a regular hand operated rivet gun with aluminum and have really good success. You can buy a small rivet kit online for probably about 30 or $40. It'll come with an assortment of different rivets, a high quality hand rivet gun, and sometimes even backing washers, which go on to give some more support to the back of the rivet. However, when you get into something like this, which we're gonna to use today, this is stainless steel, a hand rivet gun just will not work and you have to use something either like this pneumatic gun, which operates off your air compressor, or in some cases, even a hydraulic uh, riveting gun to, to actually actuate these. Stainless steel is extremely durable and in order to actually manipulate it on the riveter, it takes all my air compressor driven gun can produce and uh, without it, I wouldn't be able to do this project. That's one of the things when you do buy a kit like this, you need to understand you're either going to have to borrow or buy one of these things to actually have success and determine whether or not that'll work. But you do need to make sure that you understand these things um, are hard, hard material. Using a 3 16 drill bit, I'll open up all of the blank holes and then insert one of these stainless rivets and a backing washer. Before I pull on this, I am going to use a C-clamp just to compress all the components and make sure they're as tight as possible before I put the rivet gun on and pull the rivet home. These stainless rivets take an incredible amount of force to pull through. And even my air rivet gun just barely pulls these things through. You can see Holy cow, it really takes a lot to break these. There we go. But eventually, 
it does do it. Oh my God. But they're really super strong. I'll just keep working my way along here and finish things up. Well, I managed to drill out all of the holes and get the stainless steel rivets in place where I needed them. And I think they look pretty good. Up front, there were some larger rivets that are supposed to use a self-tapping screw, but of course, they didn't include any of that hardware. So what I did is I used some M8 by 125 hardware with uh, washers and uh, locking nuts on the back. And I think overall it works pretty good. It looks decent. It really did straighten out that bulkhead. And if you look at these photos here, I think you'll agree it's much straighter than it was when we first started. So I think we're done with this project. I'm gonna start putting a few things back together on it. And Mark, we're getting really close to riding here. And I guess that also brings us to the end of today's episode. This series on this 2005 GTX has been a lot of fun and we're getting close to getting it back onto the snow. I have to say that this bulkhead repair was quite intimidating. I've never done one of these before, but I talked to my son-in-law who's done a couple of them and reading the instructions and watching a few other YouTube videos, I was able to accomplish it and it wasn't nearly as stressful as I thought it was going to be. If you have the tools that you need to do this, you take your time, don't get too frustrated, you can straighten out one of these bulkheads yourself and install one of these brace kits with really good success and I know you can do it. Now if you like today's video, please leave a comment down below and let other people know your experiences, any tricks that you know to help straighten out these bulkheads that get bent on these rev chassis. I know other people and myself would be interested in that. If you really, really like the channel, you can always like and even subscribe to it. It really does help me to understand what kind of videos people like and it helps YouTube's algorithm determine if other people want to watch this type of material. So until next time, I'm going to get some more things bolted back onto this sled. Mark, it's coming, trust me. And I hope to see you soon here on Dino's Tinker Shed. Give yourself a great day. I'll see you soon.